Welcome to Suburban Action Week uh, for our advocacy talk with Elgin Community Bikes. I am Maggie Sherwinski from the Active Transportation Alliance, and um, I've got Brian Larson here. He's a former intern from Active Trans and a current student at UIC for studying planning. Um, and I'd like to introduce you to uh, Parker, Parker from the Elgin Community Bikes. Um, he's the lead organizer lead organizer Parker Thompson sorry and um, he's we've been working with him for several years now so um, I will I will hand it over to you and um, also if you have any questions for Parker please add it to the chat um, and Brian and I will read through those questions um, at the end of um, after we hear from Parker so Parker take it away all right, thank you, Maggie. Um, so screen share wise, what we what everybody else is seeing is the slide. Yes, community okay. organizing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So yeah, thank you. So I'm Parker. I'm I'm a, yeah one of the lead organizers for Elgin Community Bikes. We're a nonprofit in Elgin, um, and we use uh, uh, we're um, we're using bikes as a as our primary tool for engagement. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we do, kind of where I started, um, and uh, why and how uh, is maybe the the framework. Um, there we go. Um, so we kind of use this framework that we're a, we're a nonprofit and we use bike riding. Um, in the, in the hopes and the goal of making Elgin a healthier, happier, and more equitable community. Um, so I, uh, I am a convert, uh, we'll, we'll call it that, um, to a, a variety of things. I, I moved to Elgin back in 2015, um, having lived at many different places, but most recently in rural Iowa as a camp director. Um, so I have background in experiential education, outdoor ed, um, those kinds of things. But um, uh, the the context and um, using bicycles a lot for uh, any number of things was not something that was part of that chapter of my life. Um, I I know that Ragbri is big, but um, we I I didn't participate that. I'm not really an open road cyclist. Um, that's not my thing. So whenever I moved to Elgin, um, I moved with a, a one-year-old and a three-year-old. I was a stay-at-home dad um, and um, converted to my new town kind of with the, um, uh, I got to move from a place where I had to drive 45 minutes to an hour to go just about anywhere um, to um, I'm fortunate to live in a close-in neighborhood to downtown Elgin and um, fall in love with being able to walk places. Um, uh, but whenever you've got two decent sized kids in a stroller, um, there's only so far you can get. Um, and so by the end of, well, I got through winter um, and got into the summer and like a beginning of the summer yard sale, I found a bike trailer. Um, to go with um, an old commuter bike that I had from uh, a different chapter of life. And uh, we opened up the town to ourselves. Um, and by the end of that summer, um, we were in the position to um, sell our second car and become a cargo bike family. Um, and so we got a long tail cargo bike um, and um, just, took to uh, bicycles as transportation and active transportation with the zeal of a convert um, is how I would frame it. And so at the, the end of my first year in living in Elgin, um, Elgin Community Bikes was kind of born as a uh, advocacy education project um, with all of the righteousness of, um, of, and zeal of a convert. Um, and so uh, it was, I started to get involved with uh, things like, at the time, Elgin's Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee, 
um, and um, wanted to start instigating from the outside as well. Um, and so that's where the project was born. And then over the years through um, uh, kind of uh, tumbling into starting to host community rides and getting to meet other people um, from across the community and then learning from across the network, um, kind of uh, along with the support of Active Transportation Alliance um, and the uh, regional uh, national networks of learning other people's stories, we were inspired um, by like stories like um, Slow Roll um, about uh, regular community rituals that are easy to access. Um, and started doing community rides, which started doing base building. Um, and so we started collecting uh, friends and allies to the cause that um, broadened perspective and got us um, connected to, to bigger or bigger ideas or other ideas. Um, and so over the course of about five years now, we've been doing community rides for um, adults, for kids. Uh, we participate in the um, loosely organized um, set of critical mass rides from across Chicagoland. Um, and then we also do uh, full moon rides um, every full moon year round, uh, regardless of weather. And then we do um, other community rides and community events that connect um, with other collaborators, whether they're other organizations uh, or other themes um, that either arise from connections or from within um, our own volunteer base. Um, so the, the why we do what we do um, has to do a lot with um, getting people connected um, so that we have a better understanding of where the community wants to go. Um, so um, in the active trans framework, the, the base building, um, one of the other ways that we frame this is through the uh, term um, human infrastructure, um, which comes from Adonia Lugo's book, uh, Bicycle Race. Um, and so um, we, we think about what we do um, from the framework of being invitational um, and lowering barriers to who can participate. Um, there are many different ways to use bicycles. Um, we, we all use them for, we potentially individually use them for multiple different reasons, um, whether it's fitness, recreation, transportation, um, but our organization's approach is that they're a tool for engagement um, first and foremost. And so um, whenever we start thinking about wh why and what we do, um, we try to remove um, as many barriers to that participation as we can um, so that more people can connect. Um, so with that why in mind, the how we do it um, has to do with um, we do things in social frameworks um, from the speed of our rides to um, what we want people to be doing if they choose to participate. Um, we prefer them to be moving at, uh, at social paces so that they can have social conversations um, so that people can um, chat with whoever they're riding with, they can get to meet new people, um, they can interact with the city. Um, so our routes try to include um, exploring resources, um, checking out uh, the ways that you might be able to move around the city um, by bicycle and also seeing some of the, um, the obstacles. Uh, we don't, we try to keep our rides um, organized in ways that we don't bump up against um, kind of the frustration barrier a lot. Um, but at the same time, it's not hard to move around any community and at least see um, boundary obstacles. Uh, and so we're uh, kind of keep those in mind as well. Um, uh, talked about barriers. We don't charge anything for our rides. And we try not to uh, do rides that center consumptive behaviors. 
it's a lot of fun to ride your bike, go to a pub, uh, go to a cafe, whatever it might be. Um, but we try not to do those as our primary um, um, programming for our schedule um, so that we're not um, adding incidental costs uh, to the experience. Um, and then um, the, the types of rides that we do um, don't require a specialized bicycle. We're not going very fast or very far. Um, and then what we require from riders, um, we have two very basic requirements and these came primarily from our insurance um, provider. And that was that everybody needs to sign our participation waiver. Um, and that's, that's available digitally, um, but the platform that we chose has a kiosk function that I can bring up on a smart device um, or any one of the, the other volunteer organizers can um, log into uh, the platform online um, to help facilitate for anybody that's in the crowd that doesn't have a connected device whenever they show up to the ride. Um, and then for any um, nighttime evening rides, um, the legally required lights. Um, and then uh, from a philosophy perspective, we try to be asking um, among the organizers, um, curious questions about who's missing and why. Um, there, are, um, there are riders in the community that ride their bikes every single day that aren't gonna come out for a social ride because they're just tired of riding their bikes and don't have time. Um, they don't have the discretionary time to participate. Um, but there are a lot of other uh, riders or potential riders um, that might not come out to the rides and um, exploring why um, any given ride might not be representative of who uh, could potentially be showing up um, are questions that we try to ask uh, in ways that are curious rather than assumptive. Um, and then behind all of this requires, um, requires this uh, position and philosophy that we're trying to do uh, inclusion um, and that we're trying to build relationships uh, rather than rack up miles. Um, there are good reasons to rack up miles. It can be fun to rack up miles. It's just not why we do what we do. Um, and we have seen, uh, going back to that question of who doesn't, who's not in the crowd, um, there are people that self-select out because they can't handle going that slow, or if they've gotten their bike out, um, they're, they're not gonna limit themselves to all the, all the more miles that we're gonna rack up in a ride. Um, with kids, we're probably not gonna do any more than three to five miles um, normally. And our full moon ride, which is our regular moderate difficulty ride, is still only going seven to eight miles. Um, we just don't ride that far or that fast. Um, uh, but it, but that comes back to why, uh, why we do what we do. Um, and so um, doing all these things, um, we're as an organization really um, working hard at um, building base building or building this human infrastructure. Um, and the way that we do it tends to lean toward a more decentralized um, social network. Um, we don't have a lot of um, power um, in the way that we do what we do. Um, we have some influence, um, but uh, at, without uh, concerted effort, it's just a decentralized network. Um, and so what this gives us so far um, is we're giving other people um, connections, um, whether they are social connections or um, I, I know that business connections have even been made on the ride uh, because a screen printer comes out for a full moon ride and chats with um, a, a small business operator that needs swag. Um, and they're able to chat about what's going on and what kind of opportunities they've got. Um, but the same is true for 
making social connections for some of those riders that love our rides, but also like to kick out 30, 50 miles on the weekend. Um, uh, and they're able to organize their own uh, small group ride based on those connections as well. Um, and then um, in addition to um, our organization developing this network um, uh, for its own sake, it also makes bigger things possible. Um, and so um, that, that comes out in a couple different ways for us. Um, right now, we're, we're kind of moving into a phase where we're gonna evaluate what our advocacy goals are um, based on where we're at so far with the base that we've developed. Um, and what that'll look like, I don't know yet, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna explore what our advocacy goals are um, what a realistic appraisal of our influence uh, can be. Um, and we'll, we'll work through that. Um, I think that's probably one of our biggest challenges is using this posture of the, um, um, uh, a human infrastructure model that recognizes that um, the convert zeal doesn't necessarily represent um, the fullness of the community, um, but you need the convert zeal at some level uh, to instigate at least reflection. Um, and so holding that tension, um, I think is an ongoing challenge um, for us. And I, I think it should be uh, an acknowledged challenge for anybody. Um, what the, the ride schedule has generally gone really well. Um, we, have, uh, we have some really good turnout uh, we had a collaborative ride with our local LGBTQ community uh, organization last summer, even in the midst of all of this. Um, and we've been using Ride Illinois' uh, interpretive guidelines on how to try to stick with, I don't even know whether the phases, I don't know what the state's level of phases are anymore. Um, but we, we had been using and still try to uh, stick to their guidelines on how big our groups should be and uh, advise people on how best to uh, stay safe during the pandemic. Um, and so for, the, for that ride and throughout um, the pandemic, we've been trying to be prepared to break groups into smaller groups to send them away from each other. Um, but anyway, for that LGBTQ ride, we hit almost 90 people. Um, and so it required four different groups based on the phase that we were in to be able to send people in different directions um, and keep those groups uh, broken apart. Uh, but it's been amazing to see the turnout um, uh, and the, the connections that are made um, in those ways. Um, in addition to being, uh, we're anticipating observing. I don't know how much celebration we'll get to do this summer. Uh, our, we'll be uh, celebrating our fifth anniversary of community rides this summer. Um, we've also just launched a community bike shop um, in Elgin. So Elgin, if, I don't know whether everyone's familiar, um, had not had a bike shop inside of city limits in the past couple of years or decade. I'm not exactly sure what the timeline is. Um, there are, there, are, there are wonderful facilities um, up and down the Fox River um, and throughout the, the suburbs, but um, Elgin itself within the boundaries and particularly uh, serving the downtown area had not had a bike shop. Um, so from a variety of perspectives, um, we saw a need. Um, our um, bike reliant uh, residents um, didn't have a place that was easy to get to, to get service or parts. Um, and um, there was also the potential that it might turn out to be a uh, financially survivable uh, thing. Uh, the bike industry is not a particularly profitable industry, um, but with uh, a gap in the market in, in the exact geography, uh, we were hopeful that it would that it would succeed that way too. So uh, last July we opened uh, the community bike shop at the end of July, um, and have uh, based the model on a in a very small way. I think maybe um, on a variety of nonprofit models, uh, but we take donations on bikes, uh, or at least we normally do. 
um, and we refurb them and then make them available for uh, sale. Um, and that, that especially on our used bikes, we're able to do a pay what you can model. Um, and then also on sales uh, uh, or service, we're also able to do a pay what you can model on that as well. Um, we do carry some new product and the new product has to be sold based on um, the vendor contracts uh, that we have that way. Um, but through um, donation um, and um, other fundraising, including uh, we just recently uh, were issued or awarded a grant from the Grand Victoria Foundation uh, to help supply it, um, funding for our pay what you can model. Um, and so the, the bike shop has been opened. Um, it has done relatively well on the tail end of um, the of the 2020 year. Um, and we're uh, looking forward to uh, whenever things warm up and um, peak bike season opens up again. Um, and then um, the, the final question that Maggie included in my prep notes was how others can get involved. Um, so we're a, we, we're, we are a nonprofit volunteer run organization. Um, nobody gets paid. Um, so um, we're always interested uh, in making more connections with other, other volunteers. Um, we're still trying to figure out the systems for that too. Um, we've got projects that are developing, particularly the bike shop. Um, and so not only is the project new, but also everybody's kind of fumbling through how do you do collaborative work whenever sharing, sharing actual physical space um, has its risks. Um, so um, uh, we, are, we are open to chatting with volunteers on how they uh, would like to get involved um, at any number of levels. Um, or if you happen to live in Elgin and you just need a bike shop connection, um, we do everything from the, the salvage parts version of uh, bike shop work uh, up through um, brand new parts and custom work. Um, so it's, uh, there is a function there that serves just, uh, just like a, a, a standard bike shop uh, would, maybe just not with as much uh, polish to the, the retail appearance. Um, so I, I think that generally covers most of it. Um, I said, normally we take bike donations. Um, we're currently on pause because of a lot of generosity and a lack of space. Um, and so whenever bikes start leaving the shop again um, in warmer weather, we'll be uh, uh, graciously receiving whatever donations uh, in bikes that come in. And we take everything from, um, a really lovely bike that you just happen to be retiring for one reason or another from your own collection to stuff that might be a salvage project um, that we strip a couple parts off of and send the rest of it to the metal recycling operations. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Parker. That was a great presentation about Elgin Community Bikes and congratulations on that grant you just got. That's exciting to hear. Um, and I love how you are so focused on people and building community and the relationships as you were describing and making sure you meet each person and really get to know them. Like that's, that's so important that, um, to, to focus on the people. It, is, it really is about the people, all of this work. And, um, and I think like just knowing you and all the work you've done in your community, like you've done a lot of really, um, really great, have, have had a lot of great initiatives around just, um, just being inclusive. Like I just noticed your website is all in Spanish also. Um, and that is, was, that, that's something that we're able to do. Um, I mean, Elgin has a lot of Spanish speakers, um, but because, um, volunteers arose out of the participation that could do that work. Um, my Spanish is enough to help me navigate interacting with potential customers at the shop, but it's not, it's not that kind of work. Um, so that's, that's community uh, assets. Yeah. Um, and you also had 
Well, I, I, I don't, was it before the, um, you had a, um, a book club with that, that book you mentioned, Bicycle Race with Andonia Lugo, Lugo um, her, her book. And could you talk more about that? Because I, I believe another group heard about what you were doing and did the same thing, um, which I think is a great idea. Yeah, so actually that was a that was a mini grant um, with Active Trans um, that we did the we did um, two cycles of a book study on that book. Um, and uh, the the first round of it was pre pandemic. Um, it, I, there's a slide there, I think, with the shot in the background. And that was our, our book study where we were able to um, we got access to a cafe space after hours. Um, so that we could meet, um, chat about the book. Um, and then after the pandemic um, closed everything down, we also did a digital uh, edition of that um, in the early half of this past year. Um, I think maybe it was late spring. Um, and um, uh, we're able to uh, discuss those ideas and hash them out um, and got some good uh, participation from the board, but also um, got wider community engagement and also got some uh, farther out uh, engagement um, with some participants from outside of Elgin uh, that were interested in the book and uh, enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, great. Can you share a little bit about what the book is about um, for people who don't know it? Yeah, so the 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 book is a um, bicycle slash race uh, by Adonia Lugo. Um, she is a PhD in anthropology, I believe, um, and um, the book is mostly memoir, um, but reflective of um, her both professional training and talent as a, as an anthropologist. She's able to talk about her own experience. Um, and do a lot of cultural reflection. And so she talks about um, kind of the, the situation um, or a lot of the context of um, mobility, um, particularly around bicycles and, um, and the interaction and intersection with race. Um, and so that has to do with the marginalization of um, who gets resources, who has access to resources, um, how um, how projects are framed. Um, uh, her work definitely informed uh, or has altered how I think about um, about some of these things um, on our need to um, break outside of our bubble. Um, that the, the part of the human infrastructure uh, is it informs us what's possible. Uh, but it also informs us what's needed and wanted. Um, and that includes the process experience. Um, she pushes back pretty hard on a, um, on, a, on, a, on an approach that infrastructure will just fix everything. Um, and it's not to say that infrastructure doesn't have a role, um, but um, she uh, definitely frames it in ways that um, who, who gets the infrastructure, where it gets implemented, um, and that uh, mobility solutions are very um, context uh, dependent. It is very important that uh, the context that the, the different solutions are being applied to um, are very sensitive to, to who's involved um, and that it's uh, complicated uh, cultural work um, in a variety of ways. Right. But it's very easy to read. It's just very, yeah. very easy and enjoyable to read. Um, but for all of its complexity, the, the writing is very approachable. Yeah. Um, it's not a PhD uh, dissertation that got slightly modified for a book. So Right. Um, Bill and Brian um, posted more information about the book and a link to where you might find it if anyone who's on this. Um, webinar is interested but and this kind of goes back to your question Parker about who is missing and why and like that important question to be asking yourself um, and you know try to try to remove those barriers and make sure 
you're creating more inclusive space for your whole community. So yeah, I, yeah, I really appreciate your work and your leadership around this. Um, Thank you. Um, so we have, there are a few questions that looks like in the chat. So um, Brian and I can um, ask you those. Brian, do you wanna start? Sure, so we have uh, two questions that following the same lines about how you've organized uh, the rides specifically. Uh, if you could talk about your like insurance requirements for the rides, as well as like what sort of uh, platform you use for your waivers. Yeah, so the um, the insurance that we, so the, the original insurance package that we got um, is a nonprofit um, directed insurance. Um, so like one part of the package is like board of directors uh, protection, um, just because you've got people that are accountable for this stuff um, that they should do their best, but also be protected um, against the worst. Um, and then the second part I think is technically framed as like an athletic club or something like that. Um, I think our max uh, participation number under our package is like a hundred people. Um, uh, I, uh, I, um, I, it, it would be more technical than that for me to figure out exactly what the insurance stuff is. Um, I know enough in, about it to send the check. Um, but the, so the requirement that they sent was actually very, very simple. They asked us to have a waiver drafted. We adapted something, I think, from the League of American Bicyclists support deep in the nether regions of their website. Uh, they had a template. Um, we went through that and adjusted some of it. Um, we're fortunate to have a, an attorney that serves on the board. Um, and um, it's, it's not his specific field, but he was just able to do some quick adaptations um, to some jurisdiction questions to make sure that we don't get sued in a Hawaii jurisdiction, even though we operate in Elgin, Illinois. Um, but the, that waiver had to be submitted to them. We use a platform called Waiver Forever. Um, I think I pay $10 a month um, for that platform and it um, allows digital uh, digital signing. I get archive of everything that's signed. Um, we collect a tiny amount of data on it. I don't really use that, but um, the things that are in the waiver are just a basic acknowledgement of like bicycling happens in the real world and things can happen. Um, and then we included a talent release uh, option within the waiver, um, asking that you know, if we take pictures at a, an at event, um, could we use them for, for our purposes? Um, and that's an optional thing that can be uh, untagged in the, in the waiver. Um, and so it's an annual thing that um, we do it by the calendar year. So in January, there's a new waiver that drops um, and it's, you sign it before your first ride and then you're good through the end of the calendar year. Um, and that way I don't have to keep track of um, when any individual had signed up on a rolling basis kind of thing. Um, and then the, the other requirement that they gave us was just the lights um, that um, participants meet the, the statutory requirement of the state. Um, so a headlight and red reflector or red tail light. Um, but the waiver forever platform is desktop or mobile uh, interaction compatible. And I don't, I don't have a lot of deep experience with anybody else, but it works for us um, and um, is a pretty affordable option at about $120 for the year. It, there is a, there's a number that you exceed um, and you'll get charged a little bit more, but it's very, like, in a big month, we might pay $15 total, so. Um, someone was also wondering if helmets are required with that. We don't require helmets. Um, it's not that we're against them, um, but the, 
um, a, a variety of factors at play. Um, helmets can be a barrier. Um, and I know that some might think that they should be a barrier, but they are a barrier. Um, very few of our rides are moving at faster than a simple jogging speed. Um, and so from a from a risk management perspective, most of the time we're not in a very high risk category on that. Um, and we're, we're looking to normalize the, the experience of using bikes. Um, that's about all the more yeah. I, I think I can say about that. Yeah. It, it's just that they're not required. They're not discouraged. Um, and sometimes they are encouraged, um, but um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think a lot of groups do have that type of philosophy around because um, it can be a barrier, but um, yes, they're, they're allowed. <laughs> People yes. can, can wear helmets and they're encouraged, but um, let's see what else, Brian, what do we have? Um, Dave, so, oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, so we have a question about how you've navigated engaging the community during the pandemic. Carefully, um, I I hope, I think. Um, so we have, um, like I said, we use the, the ride guidelines um, or at least um, we use part of the guidelines for our protocols on how we do our rides. Uh, so we uh, generally try to split groups so that we match up with the numbers of clusters. Um, and then um, we have been distributing at least referencing the guidelines on uh, masking and whatever other protocols. Um, uh, we don't do a lot of enforcement period in our in the way that we facilitate things. Um, so there's not enforcement on you have to wear a mask whenever you come out for a ride. Um, the risk experience is um, pretty low in outdoor experiences. Um, and then the, the masking behaviors are um, well, in the winter, they're easier to easier to do just in general because it's more pleasant uh, with a mask on at this time of year. Um, and then from a kind of a behind the scenes perspective, um, we've been a little bit more uh, limited in how many rides that we do um, just out of um, if it felt like things were surging there definitely wasn't an extra ride added to the calendar. Um, and um, we dropped some rides. Um, with the pandemic hit about the time that we would have normally been announcing a whole bunch of rides. And so a whole bunch of those rides just never happened. Um, the, there are a couple things that we did that are, um, that feel like core program. And we did those rides, the full moon rides, the critical mass rides, and then we had a couple of thematic rides that um, that happened um, the last summer. Um, so it's yeah, it was it was just a careful adjustment um, on trying to acknowledge um, that that difficult role of like we bring people together and people need that. They really, really do. And I think that um, we saw that in the numbers that we'd get this past year, uh, the numbers were up. But at the same time, um, bringing people together has its own risks in the middle of a pandemic. And so we tried to be careful about how we did that and uh, tried to moderate how much we did that. Um, Dave Simmons from Ride Illinois um, says, thank you, Parker, for referring to the cycle during pandemic guidelines. And, I, and he posted, I think Dave posted the link at the, in the chat also. And he has a question for you um, about what are some of the ingredients, uh, would you say, that have made your initiative successful in Elgin? Some, mm. any lessons you've learned along the way? Um, I, I think it's valuing the relationships, trying to find the, the people, people, um, the, the board that we've put together would not, uh, would not be, uh, an, 
I mentioned that we we got an attorney and that that's very fortunate, but a lot of the other people would not be, uh, they don't have a long resume of being on nonprofit boards. Um, working through the budget uh, with them is not necessarily, that's not where our conversation dwells a lot, um, but um, that they are able to um, help be reflective and also end up being community assets in um, doing the, the relationship building work. Um, and from, I, I think from what some people would say, uh, we're in a nonprofit, uh, we're in that phase of a nonprofit that it's the very early, early stages. And maybe this is where we'll always be, but the board is a working board to some extent. Um, they're, they're people that uh, turned out a lot for rides um, and tend to, uh, tend to be the people that invite a lot of other people out or um, are very quick to go chat with people at the rides and be uh, gracious hosts. Um, and it, so I guess acknowledging, acknowledging assets that show up um, and finding how to um, honor and employ their gifts uh, is, a, is maybe one of the things that we've done, done pretty well. Um, and uh, yeah, that yeah, idea. I think that's really good advice. That's um, yeah, it's about that network and um, and people. Yeah, people a lot have a lot of gifts to that they want to give and a lot of things that they want to offer and they want to be involved in the community. And it's yeah, giving people opportunities and um, yeah, finding those people who I think you're right about just people that will welcome other people. So to make it more of a welcoming space, um, yes. I think it's good advice. So I think, um, Brian, are those, I don't see any more questions. Is that right? Did I miss any? don't see any others in the chat either. All right. Um, all right. So I think we can wrap up, but um, Parker, thank you so much for, for um, sharing. Uh, everything you've been working on with Algin Community Bikes, and we'll make sure to get um, the link to your to your group out to everyone, so um, people can help support you. And um, if you know anyone in Algin, make sure to let them know about um, this group. Um, so it's a great great resource for the community. So thank you, Parker. Yeah, we thank appreciate you. it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you. Uh, tomorrow for day three, Suburban Action Week. Thanks. Great. Bye.